and I'm trying to deal with a subject which cannot be dealt with lightly, which requires care, deep understanding, and much empathy, sympathy, compassion. It's something that touches all of us. And this is the confrontation with evil. And I do not think that we have ever in history faced the issue of evil and the question of an omnipotent God as we do today. The world will never be the same after Auschwitz. We have discovered something which we can never afford to forget. How fickle, how unreliable, how savage man can be. How thin our civilization. What happened in Germany before the war, since 1933, and right through the war, is something which has revealed to mankind the depth of human depravity and which humbles us all, for we are all included in it. There is nothing, literally nothing, that the Germans do that we are not capable of doing. Perhaps not individually, but as a nation. Something of it you saw yourselves during the war of Vietnam, how far man can go in destruction, in vengeance, in evil. And so the answer that we would like to give was God at Auschwitz has to be given with great care. It mustn't be something that we try to justify God by finding side issues. We have to humble ourselves and realize that this is one of the major problems that confronts the unbelieving world. If God is God, how is Auschwitz possible? Now, Auschwitz is never, is not anymore, as it is usually used, a geographical designation. It stands for a collective fact of human depravity and human suffering which has become the expression of the mark, as it were, of the 20th century. You must realize that Germany has, as I'm sure you do, Germany has a very great cultural tradition. All the great philosophers, many of the great musicians, much of Christian theology, the great Christian hymns, the seat of reformation, is all centered upon that land. And that such a people, a people which produced Goethe and Schiller and Beethoven and Mendelssohn and Kant, the great philosopher, and Schleiermacher and so on, could so easily be mesmerized, be led astray, and commit atrocities which are beyond description.
reveals the nature, the true nature about man. And Jews naturally are asking us, because they were the major victims under the heading Auschwitz, there were others. There were Poles, there were Russians, there were some Germans, there were Czechs, there were Austrians, there were Slavs, Yugoslavs, and so on. But the Jews were the major victims. They were persecuted not for political reasons, because they, they were not involved in a political controversy. They were not persecuted for any other reason except for the race except for the race. And they naturally ask, and they ask with a tremendous insistency, was God at Auschwitz? And they try to give an answer. The answer is given by various Jewish writers, both on the Orthodox side and on the liberal side, and on the part of the atheists. But whatever the answer is, it is a tortured answer. It is a, an answer which comes from the depth of despair. And uh, we are, as Christians, greatly challenged. Have we an answer for our shows? Now, there is a false answer a glib answer of which most of us are guilty. I have come across Christians all, from all over the country and beyond who say, ah, oh, the Jews suffer because of Jesus Christ. They are the crucifiers. Now this is a heartless answer. It's a pagan answer. It doesn't apply anymore. It contradicts. It con I would like you to talk about it when I finished. You may even talk to me. It contradicts the nature of God. The Bible says that God visits the sins of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation, but not the twentieth or the hundredth. What kind of God is he who still punishes the Jews for the crucifixion? Christ died for them. The other answer that us frequently given is, oh, they put a curse upon themselves by saying that his blood be upon us and our children. This is the most incredible answer, because God is greater than our stupid misconceptions. The Jews may have said that, but God wants to bless Jews and Gentiles alike. He's concerned with mankind. Jesus Christ died for humanity. When we take that kind of position, that pagan position, we simply annul the prayer of Jesus, who said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. So let us not try easy answers but Christian answers. Let us organize about it. And let us not say that, oh, the Germans have done it, but we nice Americans would never do such a thing. We have done, and we can do. And we are all involved, and the church is involved in a very special way. It would take me out of my way to explain how. And so, there are many Jews who said that God died at Auschwitz, and that there is no God. One of the, of the outstanding Jews is Rabbi Richard L. Rubenstein, who wrote that challenging, and with remarkable skill, a very remarkable book, out of the depths of despair, called After Auschwitz, 1966. I don't know what you read, but it's worth reading. 
Uh, let me quote a passage. I feel rather at ease today, this evening. I don't have to keep time. You will be sitting here till 12. What does it matter? Let me make a point. <laughs> Let me read a passage which I have in front of me. It comes from page 69, if you want the evidence. After the de death camps, Jews cannot maintain. Listen, after the death 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 camps, Jews cannot maintain the myth of an omnipotent God, a God of history, nor can they maintain the corollary, the election of history. A God who tolerates, that comes from page 87, a God who tolerates the suffering of even one innocent child is either infinitely cruel or hopelessly indifferent. There is logic in it. Given the assumptions, given the premise that God is omnipotent, a God who tolerates the suffering of even one innocent child is either infinitely cruel or hopelessly indifferent. Because he cannot accept either propositions, Rabbi Rubinstein declared himself an atheist. He's still a rabbi. He tries to help people. He's a wonderful speaker. He's a great writer. He comforts people. But he says, don't delude yourself. There is no God. And if you think there is, look at us. Now, the Auschwitz story, it so happens that I have uh, just completed a manuscript which I sent to a publisher, and I hope when it comes out that you will buy a, a dozen each person and, uh, and distribute it. But I have had to involve myself in that story of Auschwitz. One of the major writers on the subject is a man who in his youth was an inmate and by miracle survived and his name is Eli Wiesel, that's the way to pronounce it, Wiesel, W-I-E-S-E-L. He has concentrated his life in trying to puzzle out the question, of our, uh, the question of Auschwitz, the challenge of Auschwitz, the, the implications of what happened. But Auschwitz stands for all the concentration camps, I suppose you realize, has become a symbol of the whole story, of that incredible story. And he tells, I think, one of the, one of the most terrible incidents is his story of which he was a personal eyewitness of a little boy of about 12 or 14 who was being hanged in front of all the inmates and he was so light, so emaciated I'm sorry to tell you that but you have to, you might as well know the truth. He was so light and so emaciated that the noose would not tighten. He was too light for it. And so he hung between heaven and earth, swinging in the wind, unable to die. And this is Auschwitz. This is the sin of a martyred people. And how can you possibly think that God was looking on and doing nothing about it?
There is the story. There is the story of a remarkable man who is known to the Jews at present as Dr. Janusz Korczak, a Polish Jew, a medical doctor, who devoted his life to orphan children and became the director of an orphanage in Warsaw. I just, there are several, there is a play, there is a life, there is a play, and I have here, it was performed in, in Toronto, and I was present, called Children of Night, in which he is the main character, the main person. There is a book about Korczak, a friend of mine, another Jew from Warsaw, wrote about him personally, and I have been, have been interviewed him. And here is the story about Korczak. I will read the, the introduction to the play in a few words. Did I stop the clock? I don't know. It looks it's been 7.47 for a long time. <laughs> Dr. Janusz Korczak, the, the principal character of this play, was undoubtedly one of the most remarkable men of the 20th century. His was a life devoted to children, a devotion of love that extended to more than 3,000 homeless orphans during his career as a renowned medical doctor and pedagogue, a career that made his name synonymous with the crusade for children's rights which occurred across Europe at the turn of this century. Dr. Kocha proved his ultimate commitment to his children when in 1942, together with them, he boarded a train which led to Treblinka ex extermination camp and its awaiting crematoria. The orderly dignified march of Dr. Korczak, of his 200 orphans through the silent streets of Warsaw, was an act of chilling defiance, which deeply stirred the wounded spirits of the remaining ghetto population. When the unparalleled revolt broke out a short time later, Remember Korchak's children became the passionate battle cry familiar to all fighters. In 1978 was the year of the 100th anniversary of Korchak's birth. He died at the age of 63 in 1942 and uh, the point is that he had a chance of escape. He was given a chance by the underground Polish movement to leave the orphanage and the children and save his life, and he refused. And so we are talking about a man who is a martyr and a hero. hero. And the play dramatized, dramatizing the orphanage, as I said, on the last days of Warsaw was called the Children of the Night. A certain Jew called Menachem Z Zaman, uh, Rosenzaft, Rosenzaft means rose juice, it's a delightful German name, Rosenzaft writing about Korchak, asked the question again, was God present when Korchak was leading his 200 children to the crematorium? And he says he was not. He repudiates, as he says, all theological conjectures. 
The Jews had I quote to their beaten. The Jews were abandoned by God and by man. And so we are confronted with that agonizing question. Was God there? Now from the Jewish point, and there are of course Jews who will, in spite, in spite of uh, the agony and the suffering and the misery, maintain that of course God must have been there in some way. But they have a problem. They have a problem with regard to the covenant. And they have a problem with regard to my text. If you read the text carefully, there is here a very remarkable promise. The promise that God will stand by his people through thick and thin, for he is the God of the covenant. He has called Israel to be a, his servant. He is the redeemer of Israel, verse 7. He calls the princess to arise, verse 8. In time of a favor I have, of favor I have answered you. In the day of salvation I have helped you. I have kept you and give you as a covenant to the people. For he who has pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water will guide them. For the Lord has comforted his people, and will have compassion on his afflicted. The Bible knows God as a covenant-keeping God who is utterly faithful. It is at this point that I want you to learn a, a new Hebrew word. You know, you don't realize it that you know quite a few Hebrew words. We have inherited from our Hebrew tradition. To start with, although the Presbyterians are not audibly, audibly heard to be said, uh, to be saying Amen, but you are meant to, you know. I was listening, because being an Anglican, I'm so used to, both as a Jew as an, and an Anglican, I'm used to hearing the congregation say Amen. But you, you, you somehow will probably say it under your breath, I hope you do. But you know, Amen is a very remarkable word. It's an untranslatable word. It relates to the covenant. And you probably don't, people say, well, Amen means so be it, it doesn't. <laughs> Amen the, it relates to the covenant. And God is called, if you, um, unfortunately, the, the translators had a problem with it. And because the word Amen and the word truth is interchangeable in Hebrew, the God is called the God of Amen in chapter 16 of Isaiah, 65 of Isaiah, verse 16, 16 the God of Amen. In Hebrew, Elehe Amen, Amen. And our Lord is called by the name of Amen in, that, in, in the Revelation. And there you have the translation of Amen, a true and faithful witness. Ami means true and faithful. And because God is the God of our men, it means that he is utterly the God of the covenant, true to his promises, true and faithful. Have we got it? But this is not a word I want you to, uh, to learn. I have an even better word. The other word, of course, is Emmanuel, which is a whole sentence in Hebrew. Emmanuel, God with us. You, I think you have it. You have it on your money, didn't you, or somewhere? It's, it's in the Constitution. 
In other words, it's hallelujah. A whole sentence. The word hallelujah is a whole sentence. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Yah stands for Jehovah or Yahweh. And of course, everyone knows the word shalom. But I, and Hosanna, Hosanna, it's all beautiful Hebrew words. But I want you to learn the word chesed. Chesed, you have to be Scottish like myself <laughs> to say that chesed is untranslatable. And for this reason, the revised standard version translates it by paraphrasing steadfast love. It's a covenant word. It's a covenant word. It stands for his faithfulness. I know we try to translate it with loving kindness and so on, but it really is a covenant word and stands for the undeviating faithfulness of the living God. And so we built into the whole structure of biblical theology is the covenantal promise that God is faithful to Israel and faithful to the world. And how is he in view of Auschwitz? In a very peculiar way. He shares, and I say this very, very carefully, he shares in our suffering. He is not a God who looks on, and that's where we differ from the synagogue and from Judaism. He just does not give the Torah and say, you behave yourself. The Torah, you know what the Torah means, the five books of Moses. It's all there, you keep it. He gives himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And what we are saying is that God was at Auschwitz in the person of Jesus Christ. He was right there. My friend Ulrich E. Simon, who teaches Old Testament at King's College, London, England, wrote a most remarkable book, and Dr. Kack has a copy. You may, may as well borrow it, if you promise to return. And believe it or not, it's called A Theology of Auschwitz. Now you try, you're a young theologian, just come from from the seminary, you try to write a theology of Auschwitz. Now Simon has a right to do that. He is a Jew of German origin, a Christian believer. His mother perished as a result of the persecution. He's lost family, mem members of family. He is a, an exile as a result of the Nazi upheaval. And he had, as a Christian believer, to sort out what does Auschwitz mean. And he had only one answer. Without the God-man, he says, Auschwitz would stand as a nightmare, the culmination of unreason and malice, on page 109. And he says on page 158, the cross gives a new wedge to the infinite qualitative distinction between God and man in its acclamation of the creator of the universe as the lamb of sacrifice. What we are saying is not that God was watching people perish in the ovens of Auschwitz. What we are saying is that God was suffering with them in the person of Jesus Christ. Verse 15, verse 15, 
Can a woman forget her suckly, sucking child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have graven you on the palms of my hands. You walls continually stand before me, or are before me. And I ask myself, are these the walls of Jerusalem, or are they the walls of Auschwitz? And surely they are also the walls of Auschwitz. God was not watching indifferently. He was suffering with his people in the person of Jesus Christ. Now this participation of a suffering God, which is the essence, you know, it's not a philosophical concept, it's a biblical concept. The Greeks have always fought against the suffering God. Is entered the whole perspective, perspective of Christian thinking and has entered into the literature. You will remember if you have read the Russian, the Russian author, the famous Russian author Dostoevsky, the brother Karamazov, the great vision of the of the chief of the chief inquisitor Torquemado, leading a group of people, heretics, as the Church declared them, to be um, burned on the on the on the at the stake. That Jesus joins joined the procession. And the inquisitor turned round and said, Jesus, you must not come. It's our business, not yours. There is a bitter irony here. And Jesus went to be to be uh, burned, to be crucified again with suffering people. The Russian, the, the Polish uh, Author Sienkiewicz, Hendrik Sienkiewicz, it's <laughs> a good name, uh, wrote Quo Vadis. Some of you may be old enough to remember them too. When Jesus meets Peter, who's trying to escape from Rome during the persecution, and he said, Quo Vadis, where are you going, Master? And he said, I'm going to be crucified. Again, he is not an indifferent, glorified Christ who sits upon a throne and enjoys people being burnt. We do, but not him. I want to quote a communist, you know, who has perhaps a better understanding who Jesus is than many a pious Christian. I don't know whether you will ask me again. You probably will never ask me again, so I might as well tell you the whole truth and nothing else. I'm referring to Upton Sinclair. Do you know the name? He wrote a little book called The, the, Man of, the, the Son of a Carpenter, or something like that, where Jesus was a painted figure in a chapel, in a church, in a church window, watching the misery and the suffering of humanity. Night after night, and in the end, he could not bear it anymore. And he walked out of the window and became a living person who walked through the streets and tried to comfort people. Homeless people, orphans, people without work, done and out. And after a day, a night of... Uh, distress and suffering, on a Sunday morning he came back to the very same church to have some quiet time with his father in heaven. It's a delightful story. You know. And the minister, a comfortable man, well-dressed, you know, with a very decent congregation, almost as good as yourselves, uh, stood up and began to speak about Jesus. And he said something which our Lord never said. He, you know, we, we, in our sermons we invent a lot. 
And, uh, and uh, the man, the Jesus there, got up and protested. And the church warden, or what you would call an elder, I suppose, it, that was an Anglican church, by the way. <laughs> you haven't got any, any, any stained glass windows. Uh, the church warden got hold of that man, that stranger, and said, you, don't you start a fuss here, and he began to push him out. When the minister looked around and saw a hole in the window, and he suddenly realized it was Jesus. And he said, you go back where you came from, this is our place. Much, you know, it's exaggerated. But the point is that Jesus is not just the painted figure in the church window. If he is anything, he is the living Savior who suffers with people. And this is exactly what, what um, Ulrich Simon was trying to say. A theology of Auschwitz. Now there is a note, a personal note in all this. I'm not just a preacher, but I'm also a participant in the story of persecution. My father was taken away by the Germans two months before the end of the war in a city of the Ukraine called LWOW, Lwuf or Lemberg. And I don't want to become sentimental, I don't want to to move you at all, I just want to state the fact. Mother was left behind. And you can imagine the anguish. She knew that he will never return. And she broke down. And she couldn't sleep. And in the night, now she told it, she lived, oh, she survived the war and lived with us for 17 years, first in England and then in Canada, and I'm telling you what she told us. In the middle of the night, suddenly, the room lit up and the figure appeared at the end of the bed full of light and she knew who he was that was her only personal experience of the living Christ in a very particular way she was a believer before but it made all the difference to her he put his hand upon her and she was comforted I'm telling you this personal story because I would like you to realize that I am involved in this. I too know something about Auschwitz and more so now than I did before I started to read the literature, although I, I knew from the, my family, my brothers, two of my brothers who survived, and from what I was reading before. And for me, and for many others, the only answer I can give is that the living God, in the person of Jesus Christ, participates in our suffering and is our only hope. Now this may sound very pious, but you know, for the Hebrew Christians in the, in the concentration camps, and I know a number who have told me that, the presence of Jesus Christ was very, very real. Jesus who suffers with his people. And isn't it for us 
You know, we shrink, we naturally shrink from suffering. It's quite human to do so. And we try to cover up the facts of life. The ugly things we sweep underneath the carpet and pretend that all is well. But this is a frightening world. A world of terror. A world of murder and rape. And we do not stand alone. We stand with him. And we are meant to suffer with him for the sake of the world for which Christ Jesus died. I want to finish with a little poem which is rather moving. It was written by a Jewish girl, as I taking it by the name. She calls herself Leah, and there is no, no uh, full name but only G. Leah G, aged 14, a girl who lives in Ottawa. And I'd like to say that what she says about herself is true about our Lord. Listen to this. I stood and watched her standing there, large dark eyes and curly hair, a colored girl, dressed in rags, undoubtedly made from sugar bags. She looked up, stared into my face, conscious she was one of that lone black race, and looked back wondering if she knew. We had something in common, for I too was a Jew. And I think that Jesus Christ, the Jew, suffered with his people.